Well, first of all, very big thanks to John for inviting me to, to give this talk. I've done this kind of thing um, on several occasions. And it, it's always a very uh, stimulating e experience speaking to a group of people like, like you. Um, and I've come to realise that, that there's going to be a whole spectrum of um, people in the room, some of whom, for some of whom CLL is a very new thing and you don't know so much about it, and others of you will be real experts and probably know more than I do. Uh, and therein lies one of the challenges to, to sort of pitch um, a presentation at a level that will meet everyone's requirements. And I'm going to probably fail to do that miserably, so that's my, my kind of uh, apology in advance. Um, so anyway, um, let's just work out how to move this on. Yeah. So I thought you'd, you'd be interested to know what right I've kind of got here to be lecturing uh, to you about CLL. Um, so I've, I've been a consultant um, for 18 years, and right from the outset I've um, specialised in the disease and, and, and related diseases, including lymphoma. I've published quite a bit on it, most, um, uh, mo most, mostly on CLL. Um, I've been a member of the... Um, the trials group, the so-called NCRI CLL subgroup, uh, again for about 18 years. Um, I chaired the UK CLL forum for six years. I took over from Terry Hamlin, who was the inaugural chair. Um, it was set up in 2000, and Terry stepped down in 2006, and then I did it for six years before f handing on to George Follows. Um, I've actually um, put lots and lots of uh, patients into or at least I should rephrase that, I've, I've uh, counselled lots of patients about uh, trial entry, and I've looked after lots of patients who have been uh, in clinical trials, and I can see some of them in the room uh, today. I've led some of those trials. Um, I'm a co-author on the, the guidance um, that, that um, the previous speaker referred to, and I've been a, 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 a medical expert for several nice appraisals. So those are my credentials, but, this is a really important but, um, I'm, I'm hum I, I've got limitations, as, as indeed as everybody, so I'm only human, and like all humans, I don't know everything, and like all humans, I forget things, and I make mistakes, um, and I think it's really important that we all face up to that, that reality of, of being human, uh, and then we can mitigate those uh, limitations. Um, also, I, I, in CLL, lots of decisions kind of depend on things going on in your life and what your priorities are. And, and, and obviously, I don't know those things. Uh, 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 and that's a limitation of my ability to, to advise. And therefore, when making decisions, it's really important that those things come into the, the mix. So all of this really under, underscores the importance of these things I've listed here. So first of all, teamwork. Um, you know, years ago, I was chatting to, to, to somebody um, a few minutes ago. Years ago, it was the, the consultant told the patient what to do and the patient did it. And, and thank, thank God those days are, are long gone. These days, we work as, as, as teams. Um, so we've got the, um, the doctors with the medical knowledge. We've got the uh, specialist nurses who have other complementary uh, knowledge and, and lots of practical knowledge. Um, we've got the, the, the carers, and right at the centre of the team, the most important member of the team, is the patient. And, and it's really important that we acknowledge that and, and, and remember it. So teamwork is, is crucial. Um, and following on from that, um, decision making should be collective. Um, so. I guess in medicine there are some scenarios that are really easy. You know, they're, they're, you know. Um, if you think about high-grade lymphoma, that, that's a really, relatively easy disease to make decisions about because it's the sort of disease you can cure. Patient needs treatment straight away. There are, there are relatively few controversies about what that treatment should be, so you just crack on with it and, and Bob's your uncle. Um, CLL's not quite the same. There are lots of ambiguities and uncertainties and pros and cons and options that need weighing up. Um, and there's no absolutely right answer very often, uh, and, and what's right for one patient may not be right for another. So under those circumstances, it's really important that decisions are made collectively, and everything's factored into the decision-making process. And the final um, 
issue is is to do with I suppose quality controlling the the medical advice that you are given um, and to do that we need we need peer review so we need we need doctors to work as teams and we need doctors to feel free and uninhibited to discuss difficult cases and face up to situations that they're not sure about um, and, and, and chew it over with colleagues and at the end of the day hopefully you'll get something sensible coming out the other end that, that, that can be relayed to patients as part of the decision making process. So I think this is all really, uh, and, and this happens in most places nowadays I'm, I'm pleased to say and it's a, it's a major step forward compared to the sort of approach that was applied you know 20, 30 years ago. Um, so I ho hope you agree with me about, about that. Okay, so the rest of my talk, I, I, I need to thank John because he gave me a very uh, clear steer. I think he'd probably sat through my previous talks and <laughs> thought, oh my God, we don't want a rerun of, of that. So, so um, <laughs> he, he's not contradicting me, I know. So, so, um, so, so he basically gave me a very clear steer to, to keep it nice and simple, keep it nice and brief, don't overdo the slides. So I, I've tried to follow that advice. And he was even kind enough to, to give me um, some, some kind of bullet points to, to structure my talk, which I've actually adopted uh, verbatim. So, so <laughs> I do need to, to acknowledge John's contribution to my uh, presentation. So just going through these things one by one. So, so the, these, these, are the, these are the bullet points that, that John felt um, were important and relevant to, to everybody in this, this room. So first of all, what informs decisions about when to treat. So this is a when to treat question. Secondly, what treatment options are there? Um, so that's, that's the, the, the scope of the treatments available. Thirdly, what guides the choice of treatment? So what factors guide which treatment to have? And what are the sort of pros and cons that you need to consider when making treatment decisions? And then the, then the specifics of the, the treatments um, first and second line treatment, what, 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 what specific options are on offer, um, what, which sort of patients um, are going to benefit most from, from specific treatments. Um, and then the issue of clinical trials, hugely important because that's how, how progress is made. Um, and finally, new treatment developments. So I think this is a really nice framework and I'm very happy to um, use this uh, to, to structure the rest of my talk. Okay. So, first one, what informs decisions about when to, to treat? So, I guess it's, it's actually quite, quite simple in a sense, and, and in another sense, it's actually quite difficult. So, taking a sort of simplistic view, you, 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 you treat CLL if it's causing problems, and those problems can be in, in the form of symptoms, in other words, uh, things that you experience as patients that interfere with your life or complications um, and these these are they, they can be actual complications or or imminent complications and these tend to be things that we as doctors tend to worry about more um, so um, for, if we take symptoms first of all I guess the um, the, the most striking and consistent symptom that I see in patients with CLL is, is profound tiredness, actually. Um, and it, it, it kind of, like, like all CLL-related things, it creeps up on you slowly. Um, because CLL is a slowly growing disease, none of the symptoms that are associated with it hit you like a train. They just, just creep up on you so slowly sometimes that you don't even realise that they're there until you make them better and then realise that you weren't so well in the first place. Um, on the other hand, all the, all the symptoms of CLL can be caused by other things. So it's really important to, to first of all, I guess, recognise there's something not right. And secondly, to, to try, and, try and be convinced that, that those symptoms are due to the CLL rather than something else going on. So tiredness is, 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 is in my experience, by far and away the most striking uh, and consistent symptom. Um, classically, patients with CLL can get so-called B symptoms, and they consist of fever, 
uh, night sweats and weight loss. Um, we, I do see this. It's not very common. When I do see it, it's, it's, normally, it's normally in proportion with the amount of disease that the patient's got. So I rarely see these symptoms in patients that don't have very much disease. They're, they've got a low, lowish, high, you know, higher lymphocyte count, but not that high. They've got a few glands maybe, but not really big glands, and, and their liver and spleen isn't, isn't so enlarged, um, and their bone marrow is working properly. So, so um, to, to get... The, the full-blown CLL symptoms, you're normally dealing with a patient that's got lots of disease on, on, on board. But it does creep up on you slowly. Um, so from, from our point of view, the, the sort of complications we worry about are to do with failure of the bone marrow and the immune system. So I guess the, you know, we, we find CLL in the blood because that, that's, that's where it's easiest to find it. And, and that's how many patients, most patients these days are diagnosed, incidentally, through, through blood tests done for other reasons. And you, and you find these, the lymphocyte counts raised. Um, but what you see in the blood is really just a shadow of what's going on in the body's tissues. That's where the, that's where the business happens in, in CLL. So the disease grows in the bone marrow. It grows in the lymph glands, it grows in the liver, and it grows in the spleen. And when it grows too much, it can interfere with the function of the organs that it's growing in. So if you think about the, uh, the bone marrow, the, the, the simplest way to think of what the bone marrow does in, in health is it's the factory that makes the healthy blood cells. So as, as the disease grows in the bone marrow, it squeezes out the healthy blood-forming cells, and patients then run short of, of healthy red blood cells, healthy white blood cells and healthy platelets. And that in turn gives rise to, to, to some symptoms. So um, when you run out of red cells, you become anemic and that makes you tired and breathless and so on. Uh, when you run out of platelets, it impairs the blood clotting mechanisms. So patients can uh, bruise easily and get little sort of um, what we call petechiae, little red spots on their shins sometimes and, and blood blisters in the mouth and nose bleeds and so on. And when the uh, disease um, causes, uh, grows and, 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 and reduces healthy white cells, patients are obviously susceptible to, to infection. So, so that, those are the complications that arise when the disease grows too much in the bone marrow. And we would intervene, you know, if, if we saw the, um, the, the platelet count going down or the haemoglobin going down below a certain level, that would be our trigger for, for, for starting treatment even if the patient felt perfectly well because if you if you left that patient it would just get worse and worse and worse and then it would make actually giving the treatment quite difficult because of the side effects of the treatment overlap with those things that the disease causes itself so it can compound the whole situation so that that's the disease the disease growing in the bone marrow and and, and um, obviously the disease also lives in the lymph glands and that's where the immune system lives so if, the, if as the disease expands in the lymph glands it stops the immune system working properly and that can be seen in one of two two ways so first of all the normal immune system can fail um, so the, the, the immune system's like, it's sort of in three bits, really. You've got the healthy white blood cells that are made in the bone marrow. They're part of the immune system. And you've got the, uh, the sort of clever bit of the immune system that lives in the lymph glands. And there you've got your B cells and the T cells. And CLL can mess up the function of all of those things. Um, and obviously, if, if, if your immune system fails, you're, you're, you're vulnerable to, to infection. And the sort of infections that you, you get due to CLL are typically... Um, things like chronic chest infections, chronic sinus infections. It can predispose to shingles. And I dare say that most people in this room or many people in this room have experienced at least one of those things during their, during their patient journey. Um, so that, that, that's, that's, uh, all, all of these are complications of, of the disease that, that would um, trigger you to think about starting treatment. Um, the other thing that would push you into starting treatment is, is, is the rate at which the disease is growing. So some people are, are fortunate enough to have a very kind of smouldering form of the disease that just, just, just sits there, you can see it, doesn't do very much. Others have a form of the disease where you plot the graph and it just goes up exponentially with, with, with time. Um, so the rate at which the disease grows is, 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 it factors into decision, into decision making as well about when to start treatment. 
And then, of course, there's the, um, the issue of what, what's going on in your life. Um, so there may be, everybody has a life outside of CLL, and, and, and there may be things going on that um, are important to you and you want to be well for. And that can be a reason for putting off starting treatment. If you've got a family wedding, for example, coming up in the next you know, few months or weeks and you, and, 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 and you want to be well for that and not be on treatment, it's perfectly reasonable hanging, hanging fire, provided there's no urgency going on to, to get that out of the way before you start. And this brings me to the issue of the concept of a treatment window. Because, because the disease grows slowly, you don't suddenly wake up one day needing treatment and not having needed it the, the day before. You kind of gradually move into this, this period of time where treatment is a reasonable thing to do. It doesn't suddenly start, it doesn't suddenly stop. And, and the period can be many months. Um, there's no point starting it too soon because it, we know that it doesn't do any good. We know that from, from research that, that's been done. Equally, you don't want to leave it too late because then it becomes difficult to give the treatment that you need in order to make you better. Um, so there's, there's this ideal period of time where it's a reasonable thing to start treatment, but there's flexibility within that period to start it sooner rather than later, depending on you know, w what's going on in your life and also where you're coming from. There are some people that just want it over with as soon as possible. They don't like the idea of just sitting on something that's, that's destined to happen. It just, just puts their life on hold until they crack on with it. So all of these things factor into the uh, decision-making process. Okay. So that's the, the when, when to start question. So now moving on to the, the what to have uh, question. What are the treatment options? So here I'm just going to go through the, 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 the main sort of tools that we've got to, to treat the disease. So I guess we need to start off with chemotherapy drugs. Um, so chemotherapy has been around for... for decades. Chlorambucil has been around for 50 or, or 60 years. Um, and in fact, when, when, I, when I became a consultant, that's pretty much all we had um, in our toolbox. And it's quite remarkable to think how much progress has been made over the last 18 or 20 years in terms of all the other drug options that, that, that we now have. So chlorambucil, uh, I guess, is, is an example of, of, of a gentle form of chemotherapy. And it's the, the gentle form of ke chemotherapy that we use in, in CLL. Um, like all chemotherapy, it's a little bit of a blunt instrument. Um, it works by damaging the, um, the, gene the, the genetic uh, material in the leukemia cells, the DNA. And that triggers the leukemia cell to essentially commit suicide. That's how chemotherapy works. But, it, as I said, it's a slightly blunt instrument, and, and, and all chemotherapy drugs cause collateral damage to healthy cells and damage different tissues to varying extents. Um, and and the, 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 the tissue that's most susceptible to damage by chemotherapy, the healthy tissue, is, is the bone marrow. And that's why, whenever we give chemotherapy, we see a reduction in, in the healthy white cells, sometimes the platelets, sometimes the red cells. Um, and we need to allow that damage to recover before we give the next cycle of chemotherapy. And that's why we give the chemotherapy in, in, in cycles and give patients a break in between so that bone marrow damage can recover. If we just gave one you know, chemotherapy cont continuously, we would damage the bone marrow so much that, that there would be nothing left and you wouldn't be able to produce red cells, blood cells, white cells and, and, and platelets. So... Chlorambucil, it's, 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 it's a very well-established drug. It, it's, you know, it, it, it works, uh, at least in, 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 in most patients. Um, but it doesn't work brilliantly effectively, I think it's fair to say, um, compared with some of the newer treatments. But it is well-tolerated. So you've got this, this swings and roundabouts thing going on that, that is a common theme amongst the, amongst the chemotherapy drugs. Um, gentle chemo, yeah, it works. Gentle chemo, pretty well tolerated. Stronger chemo works much better, but more side effects. Um, and it's really, with chemotherapy, it's really hard to um, dissociate the, 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 the beneficial effects of the treatment from the unwanted effects of the treatment. 
So going up a notch, we've got bendamustine. Um, this is also a drug that's been around for quite a long time, but was, was, was undiscovered. Uh, it was developed in, in, in East Germany, um, and only after the reunification of Germany did it, did it sort of enter um, the, the sort of Western awareness, I, I, I guess. Uh, but it's actually a very good drug. Um, and it's a bit like chlorambucil. It's, a bit of a, it's like a cross between chlorambucil and fludarabin in terms of how, exactly how it works. Um, so it's a bit stronger than uh, chlorambucil. It has a few more side effects, but, but works a bit better. And then we've got um, more, the, the, the most intensive chemo that we use in CLA is, is, is a combination of two drugs, fludarabin and cyclophosphamide. Um, fludarabin on its own is pretty good, but when you mix it with cyclophosphamide, it, it's even better but also there are more side effects. So, you, so you've got this spectrum of chemotherapy, three different uh, chemotherapy uh, regimens from which to choose. So then moving on to CD20 antibodies. Um, and again, apologies for, for those of you who know exactly what CD20 antibodies are, but for the benefit of those of you who don't, um, antibodies are proteins made by the immune system. Um, whose job it is to stick onto bugs and viruses and, and, and see them off. Um, so um, what, uh, what, what can be done is you can, you can take antibodies and engineer them in the laboratory to stick onto whatever you want them to stick onto. And, and, and CD20 antibodies stick onto a structure that's expressed on the surface of, of CLL cells as well as normal B cells. So when you give them to patients, they trick the immune system into think they're thinking that it's fighting a, a, a bug or a virus, and then the immune system uh, sees off the leukemia cell. That, that's, that's the theory. Um, and there are a number of these. There, there are three, in fact, that are used in CLL routinely. One is rituximab. That's the original one. Um, the other is ofatumumab, and the third one is abinutuzumab. And they're, all sort of much, they're, they're similar but slightly different. They have, they have sort of strengths and weaknesses. Um, they are all given um, into the vein, and they take, they take several hours to, to go in. I guess many of you have probably had these, these drugs. Um, uh, on their own, they, they have limited activity, but their real strength is when you mix them with chemotherapy drugs. They, there seems to be some, something magic goes on when you mix uh, an antibody drug with a chemotherapy drug. And that's led to the um, development of these three um, drug regimens, the modern sort of chemotherapy uh, antibody-based drug regimens for CLL. So um, we, with, with chlorambucil, the gentle chemo, we use either ofatumumab or abinutuzumab, and that's because of the trials that have been, that have been done. Uh, with bendamustine, we use rituximab, and with fludarabin and cyclophosphamide, we also use rituximab. And that gives rise to these, these kind of strings of letters that we use to describe different chemo regimens that, that, you, you, that, that are, can be quite confusing. Um, so we, 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 everyone refers to FCR, that's fludarabin, cyclophosphamide, rituximab. BR is bendamustine, rituximab. And O plus C is a bit ambiguous because the O can stand for either of the two um, ofatumumab or abinutuzumab antibodies. Um, but that's, that's the one that's used uh, uh, with, with chlorambucil. So those are, the, those are the kind of chemotherapy options that are available. Okay, in terms of other drugs, um, so originally we just had chemotherapy, uh, we, had, we had chlorambucil, then fludarabin came along, that was a big, big uh, step forward. Then we had the uh, rituximab and the CD20 antibody, antibodies, that was, that was another next step change. And the most recent step changes have been these, these, these very exciting drugs um, that, that target the B cell, the, the, the CLL cell, a bit like a sniper's bullet. If you can imagine chemo is a bit like a, a sort of shotgun where it blows the disease away, but you get some pellets sort of hitting other things. The, these new drugs are, are very precise. They, 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 they kind of execute the cell in a very precise way and cause less collateral damage. They're not without their side effects, I hasten to say but the side effects are generally less and different to those that you get with chemotherapy. And again, I'm sorry, there's lots of sort of jumble of letters here that, that isn't very helpful, but the, the first class of drugs are, are, are inhibitors of this thing called BTK. BTK stands for Bruton's tyrosine kinase, and it's, a, it's basically a, um, a, a protein in, in the um, 
leukemia cells that's, that's absolutely crucial for the functioning of, that, of, of those leukemia cells. And when you knock it out, the cells don't like it at all, okay? And they eventually curl, curl up and, and, and die. Um, so ibrutinib is, is, the, is, the, uh, is the first in-class drug in that category. There are others um, following on, acalabrutinib, for example, and, and, and many more. But ibrutinib is the prototype, if you like. And it really, it's really revolutionized the, the treatment of this disease for reasons that I'll explain in a minute. So that's BTK inhibitors. Then you've got PI3 kinase inhibitors. And, and the concept is similar. PI3 kinase is another protein in, in the sort of chain of signals that these cells depend on. And when you knock it out in a very specific way, um, it, 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 the cells don't like it and curl up and, and, and die. Um, Idelalicinib, unlike ibrutinib, which was developed initially as a single drug, idelalicinib was developed to be used together with rituximab. So all the Adela reg regimens have got rituximab in them as, w w with them as well. Um, you take these drugs by mouth, by the way, they're like, they're just, you do, and, and you take them continuously, unlike chemotherapy, which you, which you have in blocks um, to let the bone marrow recover, and, and antibodies that you give every month or so as, as an infusion. These drugs you take by mouth every day, just like a blood pressure pill. Um, and you keep, keep taking them for as long as they work. That's the current way of, of doing it. So, so the, the, even the delivery of the drug is very different uh, to, to conventional or to historic treatment. Um, so the, the, the issue with adelalicinib, but it's got, it's got a few side effects. So it, it, can, it can do funny things to your immune system. Um, and it can induce um, the immune system to, to attack your, your body in, in, in unusual ways. So um, one of the uh, side effects of idelalicinib is, is autoimmune colitis, where the immune system attacks your bowel, okay, and you get quite nasty diarrhea. Um, it can do the same thing to your skin. It can do the same thing to your lungs, which can be very serious and potentially fatal. And it can do the same thing to your liver as well. So it has to be used with, with care and caution. Um, ibrutinib also, also has its um, ha has potential side effects. Um, so um, the, I, I guess the two the two things with ibrutinib are bleeding because um, it affects platelets, how platelets work, and it can also cause rhythm problems in the heart, which can not just be the the sort of benign form of atrial fibrillation, but all, but can, in some rare cases can also affect the the main pumping chain chamber of the heart and cause ventricular fibrillation. So that drug also needs to be used with a certain caution. Um, okay, so those are the, the two, and, and together we call the first two classes of drug, we call them B-cell receptor inhibitors because they inhibit that, that, that signaling pathway in the B-cells. So the third drug on the list is venetoclax, and this is the prototype so-called BCL2 inhibitor. Now what BCL2 does, it's a protein that Basically, um, it's an anti-suicide protein, I suppose. That's the best way of thinking about it. It stops the cell from killing itself. So when you knock it out, the cell gets um, fatally depressed, if you like, and, 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 and um, commits commit suicide. And it's a, it's, a, it's a hugely effective drug. Um, so effective that, it, that, that, that the main side effect that we as doctors worry about is this thing called tumor lysis syndrome. And that means that the cells die off so quickly that all the chemicals inside the cells spill out into the bloodstream and, cause, and can cause damage to the body, body organs, especially the, the kidneys. And we've never ever seen that before in CLL, not, not to the extent that we see it with this drug anyway. So that's just a, a sort of indication about how, how powerful a drug it is against the disease. Um, so, yeah, uh, 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 the other two drugs are interesting because they don't kill the cells directly they kind of paralyze them, stop them from growing, and shift them from the bloodstream into the tissues. Uh, sorry, the other way around, from the tissues into the bloodstream. So if you have a patient, if you put a patient on ibrutinib or idelalicinib, the lymphocyte count actually goes up. And that's paradoxical. We think that, you know, it's not working. The disease is growing through the disease. But what that actually represents is a, a movement of the the leukemia cells from the lymph nodes and the bone marrow and the liver and the spleen into the bloodstream. And I said, I mentioned before that the, the, the disease grows in the tissues and it doesn't really like to be in the bloodstream. 
So when, when you do that, it actually helps the disease to, um, to, to, to move away from, the, from an environment that helps the disease to thrive. And then the cells, um, they, they float around in the blood, they don't grow, and over time they gradually peter out and die off. So that, that's how these, these drugs uh, work. Okay, and then at the bottom of the list we've got... Um, uh, I won't bother with this. Cellular therapy. Um, so bone marrow transplantation is, is a, um, a treatment that's been around for a while. And in CLL, we're really, really talking about allogeneic bone marrow transplantation. And what that means is essentially replacing the patient's immune system and bone marrow with, with somebody else's. And the idea is, is to... Is to, is to is to fight is for, for for the donor immune system to fight the disease in a way that the patient's own immune system has failed to do. Um, so in health, now we're, we're we're generating cancer cells all the time. Actually, it's quite a scary prospect, um, but our immune system can recognise them and, and pick them off before they start multiplying. Okay, um, and when when people get cancer, part of the reason for that is because of this failure of so-called immune surveillance. Um, and that, that process, that, that, that concept applies to, to CLL. So if you can replace the, the kind of defective immune system with, with an if effective one that can recognize the tumor and, and fight it, then that can be an effective treatment. And, and in fact, in reality, it, 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 it can work spectacularly well. Uh, and you can actually cure some patients in, in situations where they've run out of treatment options. Um, however, there's a downside to, to this. If you, you can imagine, if you put somebody else's immune system inside, um, those donor cells, those donor immune cells, will recognise the patient's normal cells as, as being foreign and will attack those as well. Uh, and, and they do, and we call that graft versus host disease. And it can be quite nasty. It can affect the skin, um, the liver, the gut, the lungs. Um, a bit like the side effects of ividelalisib, but, but worse, really. Um, so to prevent that from happening, you need to give the patient immunosuppressive drugs to tone the immune system down a bit and stop it fighting the healthy uh, recipient cells. But when you do that, of course, you're stopping it fighting infection as well. So for a period of time, maybe six months or so, the patient run, runs a gauntlet between having too much immune system for, uh, yeah, attacking the healthy cells and, and, and causing graft-versus-host disease versus not enough immune system there to fight infection. So it can be a very difficult and challenging time and an unpleasant thing to go through for patients. And, and there's a significant risk involved as well. There's a, there's a, a very significant um, uh, fatality rate, mortality rate to, to this procedure, which approaches maybe one in five. So, so it's, a, it's a bit of a gamble for patients to undergo this procedure. There's a lot to be gained potentially, but a lot to be lost as well. You're trading off short-term, very real short-term risks for potential long-term gains. So it needs, needs to be used with extreme caution and, and the risks for doing it have to be justified. Um, so I've put CAR T cells in there. I'm, not, I, I'm, just, just, I'm, I'm putting that as a bookmark really because I'll come back to those at the end. But basically CAR T cells are um, it's sort of equivalent to a transplant in many ways, a much cleverer and safer way of doing it, and may emerge as a replacement for transplant in, in due course. So I'm going to park that for now and come back to it at, at the end. Okay. So far, so good? Okay. Right. What guides the choice of, of treatment? And, and I, I, I sort of alluded to this at the beginning of my talk, but just, just to sort of deal with this directly. So I, I've divided it into, into several things. First of all, disease factors. Secondly, patient factors. And then I suppose what's available in terms of new drugs and also clinical trials. So if you think about disease factors, so there are, we, we've got some way towards um, understanding enough about this disease to, to, in some situations, predict how it's going to behave, and in particular, how it's going to respond to particular treatments. And the one thing that 
stands above all others in terms of its ability to predict things is, is this, this, this so-called TP53 business. Um, so I'm sure most of you have heard about P53 or TP53. There's a lot, a lot of confusion about the, the, the nomenclature. So just to clear that up, when, when people talk about P53, they're talking about what we call the protein. It's the, it's the actual building block in the cell that does the work. Um, when people talk about TP53, they're talking about the, the genetic code, the gene that, that encodes the protein. It's the, it's the code rather than the protein itself in the, in the DNA. Okay, so there are um, a proportion of patients with, with CLR ha have so-called disruption of TP53. And that can mean that, that so, so we've all got two copies of, of this gene in, in, in health, okay, and the, the gene can go wrong, it, can, it goes wrong in a kind of negative way, you lose it. Um, and you can lose it either because that, that bit of, um, one, one, copy, one of the two copies uh, on the DNA is actually missing, it's been delete, so-called deleted, okay? Um, or it's, it's there, you can, you can see it, but it's, it, it, it's, it's, um, it's acquired a mutation, it, it, it's, does, it, it's not normal, yeah? So it's either missing or it's not normal, and, you, and it can go wrong for either of those two reasons. And you need to do two different sets of tests to pick those, both of those things up. And you need to do the two different sets of tests because some patients have both of those things at the same time. Some patients have just one, and some patients just have the other. So if you just did one set of tests, you might find some of these patients, but not all of them, and vice versa for the other test. If you do both tests, you'll pick, you'll pick them all up. Anyway, what this, what this gene and protein do, it's, it's, it, it, it's been known about for a long time in, in can, the whole in cancer medicine. It's, it's, it's been referred to as the, so it's quite a pretentious title, the guardian of the genome. And what that means is that it, it protects the, the, the genetic material from, um, from, from going wrong. Okay? And it does that by responding to damage to the genetic material. So, so if, if, if um, um, you're exposed to radiation, for example, and that, that damages the, the DNA, and it could potentially introduce mutations that cause cancer. So what, what P53 does, it's, it can sense that damage, and it, and, it, and it makes the cell respond to that damage in, in one of several different ways. So if the damage is really severe, it will say, okay, this, you can't repair this, kill yourself. So you don't propagate that damage and cause cancer. Um, and if the damage is, is less severe, it will say, okay, let's stop growing, stop dividing, let's mend the damage, and then you can carry on dividing again. Okay, that's, that's what this gene does. And it's, it, it mediates the action of chemotherapy. So I talked about chemotherapy drugs, the, the, the slightly blunt instrument that damages the genetic material in the leukemia cells and triggers them to undergo suicide. Well, P53 is the... Is the, is, is the key to that. So when, when patients receive chemotherapy, it damages the DNA, activates this P53 protein, and the, and the protein then tells the, instructs the cell to, to, to kill itself. That's how it works. So if that protein's not there or not working, that process doesn't happen. Right? So you give the patient chemo, you damage the DNA, but there's nothing there to translate that into a, a therapy effect. Okay? Um, and that's why patients with this defect don't respond to chemotherapy, okay? So if you know that in advance, you can spare patients the unnecessary side effects of a treatment that's not going to work, okay? That's, that's, that's the idea. So, um, so nowadays, we routinely test patients for this abnormality before we start treatment, and, and we modify our treatment according to the results. Now, the other um, thing that we can look at in leukemia, in, in CLL cells, is, is the, the other sort of uh, prognostic, clever sort of prognostic test is, is the so-called IGHV mutational status. So IGHV is a gene, it's the, it's the gene that, that, that makes antibody. I, I, I mentioned you know, rituximab and the other antibodies. This is the gene in B cells that actually makes those antibodies. Um, and we know in CLL that, that in some cases the gene is in what we call the germline configuration. It's, it's just what, what you're born with. And in other cases, it's evolved in the cell to, 
to, to have changed. So, so in theory, the, the, if it makes an antibody, it can stick onto something slightly different to the, 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 the gene that, that the patient's born with. Um, so you can group patients into two categories, depending on whether this gene is mutated or not. And here, being mutated is good, um, and being unmutated is bad. And if you, if, you have, if you have a mutated IGHV gene segment, the, the, the importance here is that you can get really, really, really long remissions after FCR chemotherapy. And in fact, some series suggest that some patients might even be cured. They, they, they stay in remission for so long. I'm talking about 10, 15 years uh, and, and never relapse within that time frame. And the pattern of relapse looks like it's sort of flattened off. Um, so giving FCR to those patients might be quite an attractive idea for that, for that reason. There might be other reasons for not doing it, but that, that, that needs to sort of figure into the decision-making process. And of course, if you've already had treatment, how, you, how you've got on with it before is an important consideration as well. Has the treatment worked well before? If it has, that might be a reason to give, give more of the same. Okay? If it's not, maybe choose something else. Um, and linked in with that is, is tolerance as well. So if, 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 a, if a patient's really struggled with a, um, a particular treatment in the past, you probably wouldn't want to give, give the same treatment, again, for, for reasons of side effects rather than how well it's worked or not. So those are the disease factors. Okay, we're moving to patient factors. So I've listed their age, fitness, and other medical conditions. And they, they kind of go together, but they are to some extent separable. So you can have elderly patients who are perfectly fit and don't have anything else wrong with them. And likewise, you can have you know, unfit people who are quite young and, and, and don't have anything else wrong with them, and all sorts of combinations. So, so they are separable. But by and large, all of these three things tend to go along with not tolerating the, some of the stronger treatments so well. So if, if patients fall into uh, those categories, you might be steered away from the stronger treatments towards some of the gentler ones. So, so the, these are really important considerations when choosing chemotherapy options, for example. <coughs> Um, and some medical conditions can be specific for specific drugs. So if, if you've got bad kidneys, for example, um, there's a, there's, you're not allowed to give fludarabine to those patients if the kidneys are below a certain level. So, so that, that might point you towards another drug. And similarly with heart conditions and, and uh, ibrutinib, that's another example. Okay. <clears throat> and then, of course, you, you, we, we need to... You know, the, 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 we need to understand what drugs are out, what, what drugs are available for specific indications. It's no, no good saying, "Oh, I want ibrutinib," if it's not funded if it, by the NHS. Um, so that that's important. And then, lastly, available of availability of clinical trials. So I think I think you know, clinical trials in general is 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 a, a treatment option. Um, and I'm not sure if if Jane. Uh, uh, covered that in her presentation, but I think, I think there's, there's a lot of value in uh, clinical trials, not just in terms of making medical progress, because that's how things, things move on in, in medicine, but also in terms of what it brings to um, a unit. So if, if a unit is very used to doing clinical trials, you have to do things properly, you have to do things by the book, and you're accountable because you get visited by monitors and so on. You have to follow the protocol. So it engenders a sense of discipline and doing things properly and being thorough, which percolates outside of trials. And of course, some trials give patients the opportunity to access treatments they can't get outside of trials that, that may, not always, but may be of benefit. So, so we, we are um, enthusiasts when it comes to trials, but ultimately it's an individual decision for, for patients uh, to make. But they do, you know, I think we should always think about trials um, alongside specific treatment options as an extra option for um, uh, when, when making treatment decisions. <clears throat> okay, so um, what are the pros and cons to consider when making de decisions? So as I mentioned before, um, a, lot of treatment, a lot of treatment decisions are actually made for you because of the availability or lack of availability of, of drugs. Um, of specific drugs, especially new ones and, and, and high-cost ones like, like ibrutinib and venetoclax and so on. 
But if choice is involved, these are the things that you, you need to weigh up. So you need to think how, how, how likely is the treatment to, excuse me, to, to be effective uh, in, in, in my particular situation? And balanced against that, what are the possible side effects of the treatment? Um, and you know, how miffed would I be if I got one of those side effects uh, in, in a significant way? Um, it's not just side effects, it's risk as well. So I mentioned bone marrow transplant. Um, that, that's associated with the risk of, of actually dying as a result of having the, the, the treatment you know, in a significant proportion of patients. And actually, all, you know, if, if you look at all clinical trials, they, they all have a, you know, a few percent mortality associated with, with each of the treatments. So all these treatments that we dish out have a theoretical risk of it actually shortening your life due to, due to side effects. Um, and obviously, the stronger treatments, that, that's a bigger issue, issue for. Um, so we need to think about the risks of treatment. And then you need to think about the practicalities of the treatment as well. So um, where ibrutinib scores is, is because it's, it's, you just take it by mouth and that's it. You don't need anything else and, and you don't need to come into hospital. Um, if you're having FCR, that requires you know, monthly visits for, for rituximab. Um, and these things can be important, especially if you have to travel a long way or if you're really busy and, and struggle to, to find, find the, the time in your day uh, and, and so on. So, so the practicalities of, of treatment are really important and, and you need to understand that and they need, that needs to factor into the decision-making process. And as I mentioned before, there's, you know, everyone's got other stuff going on in their lives and, and, and there may be reasons why you, know, you, you, you would prefer a, a, a gentler, albeit, potentially less effective treatment because it's important for you to be well over the next year maybe and, and, and you're not prepared to risk feeling unwell or running into complications in exchange for a, um, you know, a higher chance of a, of a longer remission. So all these things factor into play. I think it's really important that you, you sort of ask yourself all these, all these questions. Okay, so um, in terms of the specifics of, of, of treatment of, uh, uh, decisions, I've split them into first and second line. So first line obviously means you've never had any treatment before, and I'm assuming that you've got through the sort of when question and you know treatments necessary. So so there there are, there are two two things I guess that that we that we factor in uh, and, and think about when making first-line treatment decisions. One is the presence or absence of this P53 disruption business I spoke about earlier. And the other is, is patient, um, let's, let's call it fitness, where fitness can mean literally fitness. It can extend to age considerations. It can extend to, to having other diseases going on. So basically, you, you, you've got, you've got a two-by-two two uh, matrix. So you, you're either fit or you're not fit, or you've got... Um, um, a P53 disruption or you haven't. So if, if, if your P53 is all right, it's working properly, that means that there's no, re, no particular reason why chemo shouldn't work. And under those circumstances, the, 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 the current um, frontline treatment is chemo-based, okay? Um, so it's, it's chemo plus a CD20 antibody. And then the fitness thing de decides which type of chemo is, is, is the most appropriate for you. And generally speaking, young fit patients would go for FCR, um, stronger, um, yeah, more, more, more risk of side effects, but more effective. Older, less fit people would go with, the, with chlorambucil, gentler, better tolerated, plus a CD20 antibody thrown in. Um, and then there's this bendamustine in the middle somewhere. So, it, and that's a, that's a nice option for some patients who, who maybe are, they, they don't sort of neatly fall into either category. They're not, they're not you know, spectacularly fit, but they're not falling to bits either. They're kind of somewhere in the middle, and it's, it would seem a bit much giving them FCR, but a bit feeble giving them or offering them chlorambucil. So you've got that kind of middle option, uh, the, the bendamustine option. Okay, so that, that's, that's the scenario if, if your P53 gene is working properly. If it's not working properly, then um, the, the current approach would be to, uh, and this is in the frontline setting, you can actually access ibrutinib first line if your P53 gene is not working, okay? 
Um, so that's, that's another reason why it's really important to, to check for P53 disruption because you can, you can access ibrutinib in the first line. It's the only way you can get ibrutinib in the first line if, if, you, if you show that the P53 gene is not working. Um, I mentioned that ibrutinib can cause heart rhythm problems. So if the patient's got a history of significant heart problems and you're worried about rhythm issues, um, there is an alternative, which is to give this other drug, idelalisib. That was the other um, drug that, that, that hits the other protein in the same pathway, similar to idela, uh, similar to ibrutinib, but but has has a few more side effects that you need to look out for, and you need to give it with rituximab. So that's the that's the the current sort of algorithm, if you like, for making uh, frontline treatment decisions. I stress in consul, you know, in in in, uh, in a collective way with with uh, everything fully discussed with um, patients and their families. Okay, now second line treatment is always more complicated because it's it's influenced by what what what's happened what's happened before in terms of what treatments patients have had, how well they've responded to those treatments, how well they've tolerated those uh, treatments. So it, it does get more complicated. Um, so the, the, the sort of algorithm really is to decide, so if a patient uh, need, needs further treatment and they've had previous uh, therapy, um, the question you need to ask is, is as follows, is FCR appropriate? And if the answer is no, then you can access ibrutinib or idelalisib, okay? And, and reasons why FCR might not be appropriate are, first of all, they've had it before, but it hasn't worked very well. They've not gone into remission, or they have gone into remission, but the disease has come back within a couple of years. Or the patient is too elderly or unfit to tolerate FCR, even if they've not had it before. Or if they've got a, a P53 problem, which means that even if they haven't had it before, they're unlikely to respond to it now, okay? And by and large, those are the sort of three things that um, make FCR in, inappropriate. And if, and if FCR is not appropriate, you can get ibrutinib through the NHS um, at, or idelalisib if you, if you have heart, heart issues. If, on the other hand, you, you've had um, previous treatment with, with chemotherapy plus a CD20 antibody and it's worked really well and you've been in remission for years and years um, and you don't have a P53 problem, you, you, you actually technically won't qualify for ibrutinib um, and under those circumstances the, the best option is, is uh, in the absence of ibrutinib or idelalisib is, is more chemotherapy plus CD20 antibody. Now, this has caused a lot of controversy and the reason these, the, these, these kind of um, limitations are in place are that they follow the, the entry criteria for the trials that, that prove the value of ibrutinib and idelalisib in this sort of setting. Um, and there are these um, criteria called blue tech criteria that you may be aware of, which are an extra layer of kind of filtering after NICE guidance that you need to go through before the NHS is actually going to, or NHS England is actually going to pay for your ibrutinib or idelalisib. Um, so it's, th th there's small print there basically that, that is, is a little bit irritating to put it mildly and I think probably if I, if I had to guess I'd say that it was prob probably applied in a fairly patchy way across the across the across England so there'll be some places that where you might be able to, 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 to um, get get hold of it easier than, than others a little bit you know that's speculation I can't I can't I can't say for sure but my impression is that it's 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 um, there, there are complexities around that. Um, so that, that's ibrutinib, um, second line. And then there's venetoclax, which you can get um, if you've had prior ibrutinib or idelalisib. Okay, so that, that's sort of plan C. So you've got, you got chemo, CD20, ibrutinib or idelalisib, and then venetoclax. So you've got, you've got sequential treatments to go through one after the other. And then you just have to, as I said, meet all the small print criteria for, for actually getting the, getting the drug. Okay, so moving on to clinical trials. So the thrust of 
clinical trials um, at the moment is really to compare novel agents, either alone in combination, um, with frontline, standard frontline and sometimes second-line chemoimmunotherapy, so the, the, the regimens that we've just talked about, FCR, BR, O plus C. So that's the thrust of, of where the, the kind of phase three trial activity is and where I suppose that's the direction that treatment's heading in to replace chemo, even in the front line, with, with novel agents. Instead of waiting to go through chemo and then using them second line, bring them forward to front line, even in patients that don't have this P53 problem going on. So I'm sorry about this slide. It's a bit, a bit sort of confusing, but what I try to do, I try to be clever here and try and summarize the key um, trials, the CLL trials that were reported at the uh, ASH meeting in, in December last year. ASH is the American Society of Hematology. So that's the big global meeting where anything exciting pops up. So I'll, I'll just take you, th you through this. So basically, the, um, in the top, there's this sort of two rows of, of, there's a sort of dotted line. Above the dotted line, where I've put 1L, that's first line trials, okay? So these, these are patients that have never had treatment before. And underneath the dotted line, uh, R stroke R is relapsed refractory. So these, these are previously treated patients. So each one of those little diagrams represents a, a clinical trial. And, and the, I, I've put the, the treatments in boxes that are being compared to one another with a line showing how the treatments are being compared. So um, if we just look at the, let's, let's look at the, um, the uh, relapsed refractory trial at the moment. So, um, so Murano is a, is a trial comparing venetoclax with rituximab against bendamustine plus rituximab. Um, and it basically, basically showed marked superiority of the venetoclax plus rituximab regimen above the chemo. Okay, so, it, so in, in, in relapsed refractory patients, venetoclax plus rituximab works much better than bendamustine plus rituximab. So this is now um, licensed, um, FDA and EMA, and is currently undergoing nice appraisal. And I guess there are people, I, I'm not directly involved in this particular one, so there are people in the room that know more about it than I do, I guess, but I think it's looking quite promising. It's, it's passed now. It's passed, fantastic, excellent, excellent. Um, so that, that opens up a really important um, new therapeutic opportunity for, for patients with um, relapsed refractory disease um, and doesn't require you to go through ibrutinib to get to get venetoclax uh, uh, first. So then we've got the the frontline trials and I've, 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 I've sort of tried to, to consolidate them as best I can rather than just give you long lists of things. So if we um, if we look at the, the left-hand one first, so this, is a, this, is, this trial is called Illuminate, and it's comparing chlorambucil plus obinutuzumab, that's the O plus C, with, a, with, with ibrutinib plus obinutuzumab. So you, you, you've got the CD20 antibody in both arms, but you're swapping um, the chlorambucil for uh, ibrutinib. And that showed uh, uh, that the, the ibrutinib uh, arm does much better than the chlorambucil arm. So, so that's, that's, that's uh, a positive result. Um, I'm not sure how it's sort of translating through into um, um, a, a nice approval. It hasn't, it, I, I looked up the Abrutinib um, uh, uh, license uh, and in, in Europe at least, it's not licensed for this indication yet, but I have no doubt it will be undergoing that, 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 that process. And once it's licensed, it can, it can go down through NICE. So the other, um, there, 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 then there is, there's another trial um, comparing, essentially swapping um, bendamustine for ibrutinib. Um, this is the US Alliance trial. So, so um, the, 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 the trial had three arms. Bendamustine rituximab is the standard arm. And then one arm was ibrutinib plus rituximab, where you're just swapping the chemo for ibrutinib. And then the other arm was ibrutinib on its own where you're swapping the whole of BR for just ibrutinib. And the bottom line is that, is that both the ibrutinib on its own and the ibrutinib plus rituximab did better than the BR, okay? Um, although there's no apparent difference between the ibrutinib and ibrutinib plus rituximab arms, which suggests that you don't really, 
when you add rituximab to abrutinib, it doesn't really do very much. It's the abrutinib that does the, does the business. Um, so, so that's a positive result there. Um, and then we've got the, another uh, American study comparing ibrutinib plus rituximab, that's the I plus R, with FCR. So you've, you've got ibrutinib um, being compared with FCR and with BR and with O plus C um, in, in, with, with slightly different antibody partners. Um, and all of these trials have shown a positive result for the ibrutinib arm. So, so bottom line is ibrutinib is better than chemotherapy. That's the proof online um, in this setting. And of course, then we've got the ongoing, on the, on the extreme right, we've got the, the FLARE trial, which is, it, which is comparing FCR with ibrutinib, with ibrutinib plus rituximab, although that, that arm has actually closed because we've got enough patients in that arm. And the novel arm here is the ibrutinib plus venetoclax arm. Um, which is also the, um, being tested in, in clarity, the, clarity, the phase two clarity trial in, in, in previously treated uh, patients. So that trial is ongoing and, and, and is a really important one um, globally. And I'm sure that there are many people in the room actually who actually who, who are in this, this, this trial. So that's kind of where things stand in terms of the, 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 the big kind of important trials. There are lots of, there's lots of other stuff going on. I, I, I don't, you know, I don't profess to have an encyclopedic knowledge of absolutely every trial that's, that's going on. But these are the key ones. And I thought it was really, you know, th this, this last year's ASH meeting was, uh, you know, it was dominated by, the, by, by CLL, in my opinion, anyway. And it was just it's great to see these, you know, these four really important trials coming through and reporting in such a kind of prominent and definitive uh, way. So, you know, um, really good news for patients. Okay, so it, last, last slide on, on new treatment developments. So there's, there's loads of stuff going on. I just, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't know all of it. I, don't, I wouldn't know where to start. But one thing I, I kind of thought I would just zoom in on is CAR T cells. Cause so, so they're all the rage these days. They're, you know, they, they're, um, they're being looked at in a number of different scenarios. Um, and they're actually approved, they're funded by the NHS for pediatric ALL and also high-grade, uh, you know, diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. So they're, it's actually, a, they're, you know, available through the NHS for those indications. So what they are, essentially, you, 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 take, you, you take the patient's blood out of one arm. You, it's a bit like a, a, a bone marrow, a sort of stem cell harvest. You take the blood out of one arm, you, you spin it down and you, and you keep the, um, the lymphocytes and put the rest of the blood back in the other arm. And then you engineer those lymphocytes. So these are the patient's own, own T cells and you, you engineer them to express a molecule on their surface that tricks them into thinking that they're fighting um, the CLL, okay? Um, so when you put, then you put them back into the patient, okay? And they, they latch onto the CLL cells and grow and expand and, and duff up the CLL cells in a, in, a, in a spectacular way. That's, that's how it works. And because it's a cellular product, the, the, one of the properties of cells is, 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 is self-renewal. In other words, you, can, you put the cells in and they stay there forever. They, they just repop, they, 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 they grow and they, 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 can, um, they, they just hang around forever. Um, so there's the potential to control the disease in the long, the long term. So this can work spectacularly well um, in some patients, um, and in uh, ALL, um, the, the the response rate is really high, and, and we're, we're working out that, that these these some of these responses are what we call durable. They, they're not just a it's not just a flash in the pan, and you're back to square one within a few months. They they last for for literally for for years. Um, in CLL, it, it's, the picture's a bit mixed. So there is a there is a subset of patients that that seem to do really well, but only about a quarter. Um, and until recently, it's been slightly unclear why that is. So one obvious reason is that, is that in CLL, the, the, the normal T cells get a bit bashed up, partly because of the disease, because it invades the immune system and screws up the functioning of the immune system. 
and partly because of all the, the treatments that we throw at the disease that, that suppresses T cells. So, so you know, fludarabine, bendamustine, um, all these, these kind of drugs uh, aren't very good for T cells. So, it, and because, because this therapy precisely relies on you being able to get hold of these cells, in a health, so they're healthy, you can manipulate them, you put them back, you rely on them to grow. If you, don't, if you start off with not very many T cells that, that are duffed up, the, you, know, you can imagine that you might not get a very good result from the treatment that depends on large quantities of healthy T cells. Um, and that turns out to be the case. So you can actually predict which patients are going to respond by looking to see how, how healthy their T cells are before you take them out of the patient to engineer. Um, but what's really fascinating is that, is that um, one patient um, in one of the earlier studies went into remission. And when they looked really hard, virtually all of the, all of the T cells that were there had been derived from just one single T cell that, that he'd received as part of his CAR T therapy. So one single cell had populated this patient with a whole army of, of T cells that were fighting his disease. And he, and, and he was in his 80s, and he's been in remission for five years, thanks to one engineered cell. Quite extraordinary. So the, it's not without its problems. So, so one of the, um, the main side effects of, of this therapy is, is this, this thing called cytokine release syndrome, which is a bit like sepsis. It's where the immune system gets overexcited and releases all sorts of chemicals in the blood, and it, and it, make, it, it lowers your blood pressure and... Um, you know, it can put you into circular, so a so-called circulatory failure and, and, and so on. Um, and that requires, um, n yeah, requir re requires uh, careful management. You need to an an anticipate it, have everything in place to deal with it. And if, if you do those things, you can get patients through it. And it, and it kind of burns itself out within a, within a few weeks. Um, and it, it, it doesn't happen t to everybody. It probably happens to about a third of patients. Um, the other thing that can happen is, is a funny kind of neurological syndrome. Um, so, so, uh, nobody quite understands that either. But again, it's self-limiting. You just need to know about it and be able to manage it. So you need, you need an ITU on standby, basically. Um, so it's not, it's not, it's not um, trivial treatment, but it's a lot easier and safer than a, and, and probably ultimately more cost-effective than a, than a transplant. And, and obviously, all new technologies are... Uh, costs a lot of money, but as, as time goes on, um, the, the cost reduces. So, so when, when these treatments came out, they cost about half a million pounds per patient. Um, the cost is already coming down, uh, and, and I guess in due course, they'll, it'll be on a par with, with some of the more, more expensive drug, drugs that we use. So, um, so if, I think, that for me, this is, this is one of the most exciting areas, and... I'm, 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 yeah, I think it has the potential to replace uh, transplantation in, in CLL, for, at least for, for many patients, in, in due course. So we're, at, we're, now, we're now sort of infancy with it in this particular setting, but there are um, studies ongoing. In fact, we, we are going to be setting up um, a trial called Zuma 8, hopefully, in Liverpool, um, which, which is specific, specifically for, for CLL. So... And, and the other thing to say is that you can, you can combine CAR T cell therapy with other, with other drugs, and people are looking at all kinds of different drugs. And in CLL, people have looked particularly at ibrutinib um, with some initially very promising results. So there's, there's, a, there's, an abs there's actually absolutely huge amounts of stuff going on with some really radical, novel things. And, and you know, I think, I think the, the, the therapeutic developments in CLL are just, you know, they've, they've been going up exponentially over the last 10 years. And I don't see any change in that pattern. That, that exponential curve continues to steepen as, uh, from, from my perspective to the point that it's, it's actually really, really hard just to keep abreast of everything that's going on. That's my challenge. So on that yeah, optimistic note, I'll, I'll finish and, uh, and just leave that slide up to remind you about what I've just said. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>